Welcome back everybody to the OPT Network. Our guest this morning is Nick Harris. He's a native Alexandrian, a graduate of Alexandria Senior High, played for the Oklahoma Sooners, and also had a long career in the NFL. He joins us this morning to talk about the second half of his career and how he's moving into acting. Nick, good morning and welcome. Good morning, thank you for having me. Absolutely. So Nick, take us back to a little boy growing up in Alexandria with a lot of uncertainties. Spending a majority of my time with my maternal and paternal grandparents, you know, Alexandria was all that I knew. Um, I, and I attribute everything that I am um, to, to, to them. They're the architect of my success, mm. hands down. And so when you went to live with your grandparents because your parents just weren't ready, did you kind of say, well, why do I have to be here? Or was it sort of just like a natural progression? No, um, I've been, I've, and I've said this numerous times, I've always asked the question, why not me? Mm -hmm. Like, who am I? Who am I so special that, you know, I, the, the trials and tribulations and transgressions in which that I've had to endure throughout the course of my life? You know, what, 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 makes, what makes me different? So. Uh, when do you think you were able to internalize that, though? Because as a little kid, it's hard to understand why your situation might be the way that it is. You don't. You don't. You just, you just take it as the ebb and flow. Um, and you, 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 you tackle life as it, as it comes. Uh, um, like, I, like right now, I would say that I'm quite well traveled. I had no idea that there was much outside of Alexandria um, growing up. So you're pretty much unindated to, to the, the environment in which you're in. And I just make the best of it. Mm -hmm. And so when you know that you're going to be with your grandparents and you feel that sense of safety, when do you start to dream? Do you remember? Uh, I wrote a letter to my grandmother at the age of eight, um, my maternal grandmother, and I told her that, you know, I guess it was a myth and um, an elementary project of sorts, but I told her I wanted to play professional football. And I think that that was probably the very first time that I internalized what it was that I wanted to do to get myself to, to realize like this situation probably wasn't the best. Um, and you know, to obviously television at the time, thank God there wasn't social media, but um, obviously television at the time pretty much had that influence as well. You know, you can, there's, there's other things that you can do and you can be more than what um, the limits state that you, you can be. Mm -hmm. And so when you have this conversation with your grandmother, what does she say to you? Be whatever you want. Uh, that, I mean, that, the, it was extremely direct. I'm, I'm, I've been told that I'm extremely Blunt and crass. And I get the really from my grandmother because it was like no nonsense. Um, this is who you're going to be. This is what you're going to be as long as you put in the effort to be that. Um, nobody, no one is coming to save you. Um, and at the end of the day, if you don't put in the work, then don't ask for a hand. Wow. Does that make you have to be a little bit more of an adult and a little bit more responsible than what your age? would denote at the time i got that everywhere that i went you you're wise beyond your years and then you know some people will take that and and run with it um i just took that as like i have a, a responsibility M you know many many are called but few are chosen mm -hmm. um so for me it was one of those situations that it was just like i have to do everything in my power because i not only represent me my name and who i am as a brand but i also represent my last name and I represent the people that came before me and I'll, and I'll represent the people that come after me as well. Mm -hmm. So when your parents are not prepared to be parents, does your grandmother make it clear that you're not going to be pitiful? Right. You, you're not going to get a participation trophy. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> it ain't going to happen. <laughs> nah, we're not, she, you know, we're not applauding fish for swimming. Like, no. At the end of the day, it was like one of those situations that was like, okay, cool. These are, these are the cards that you dealt. Play them. And play them to the best of your ability. So that's pretty much what it was for me. And it was like, you know, it wasn't, there wasn't a lack of love, um, you know, from both sides, my, my, my father's parents and my, my mother's parents. But it was tough. You know, I will, I, <laughs> I will be remiss if I said that it wasn't. It was extremely tough. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, like I said, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change 
Mm -hmm. And so in that toughness and having to be mentally tough just to make it through that, is there a time as you start to get older that you start to unpack what has happened uh, to create some mental well-being? Do you think that your that your mental health gets shaken by the genesis, by the beginning of your life? What's that? As an African-American young male in Los Angeles, Louisiana, in one of the most terrible rural areas per capita with violence. Um, my, I was built on survival. Get out. Mm. I, I, I didn't I didn't I didn't have time to, to 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 decompress the mental aspect of it all until later on in life. And that's what I'm saying. Like, what, was there t a time in your life as you move past the trauma of everything that happens in your life? Because it's traumatic. Yeah. Just on its face. Right. But as you now, as you get out of Alexandria and you start to see more and know more, do you start to know that? I gotta deal with my mental psyche and my mental well-being. I just looked at it like God don't make mistakes. Um, so mentally, I was like, okay, cool. You know, I, I look at it like you know, being the oldest of, of my siblings. I look at it like, thank God that it was me, mm. and who was you know mentally strong enough to make it through, opposed to someone who may have not been strong enough in taking her life or you know, subjugated themselves to, you know, pills, opioids or drugs or just saying, you know, so I just look at it like that. Mm -hmm. um, I've always tried to find the positive in everything that has happened to me. And I've always tried to take responsibility of what's ever happened to me, because if I take the responsibility, then I take the power away from whoever, whomever it, it's, it's, you know, actually doing it. Mm -hmm. And so growing up and then you at about eight years old, I guess, do you kind of know that you're going to like football? And is it loved that? It. Loved it. Loved it. And then so when you get to high school, what do you tell yourself about being great and about trying to go to the next level? And at that time, the next level is college. Well, so it was a process. Okay. Um, I, I live in an area where you, in order to go to Alexandria Senior High, you had to fill out a form called an M&M, it's minority to majority, um, where they would, you know, bust you from a minority area to a predominantly white area to say any other notes. Um, a lot of people don't really understand that process, but, it, you know, that's where we are. And I knew that that was going to be the best opportunity for me to make it to play to collegially to play ball. I'm not saying that against anyone else. Sure. Since, but, I, but I knew that at that time, personally, um, and I think that a lot of the people that they but so great. in your mind, you're making decisions about the next level. Yeah, and, I'm, and five, I'm five, six years ahead. Yeah, I'm I'm like, listen, this is what I need to do. And if I don't then and I'm making that decision. So I have no one to blame but myself. Mm. Um, I'm not giving anybody else power. You know, you know, I, obviously, I'm not going to say that I didn't I didn't have help and guidance. Sure. Really, but it was ultimately like the, the decision with whether it was with the Welches or was with my mom. Um, my, my, my stuff, my, you know, it, what do you want to do next? Mm -hmm. Um, so that's pretty much, yeah, I'm just making those decisions and I'm just trying to do as best that I possibly can because, you know, it was, it was unknown territory for everybody involved whenever I came through the situation. Wow. Let's take a break here. But when we come back, we'll talk about playing high school football and then going to Oklahoma and what that's like. Nick Harris is our guest this morning. Stay on point. We're back with more right after this. Welcome back everybody to the OPT Network. Our guest this morning is Nick Harris and he joins us to talk about his journey and what's next. So Nick, before we went to break, we were talking about making that decision to go to Alexandria Senior High School. And so when you get there, uh, talk about that process and, and knowing that you had to be the best to go to the next level. I was a fish out of water. Um, well, so with that, with that, um side of town so to speak it's like a feeder system so you, if you, you go from um brain junior high mm -hmm. and you, you leave from brain junior high and then you go to alexander senior high. that's pretty mm -hmm. much how it worked well i was a kid who went to tioga i went to brain for like a week and then pineville for a week and a half and then it was all you know, with the gifted program so i was you know pretty much you know an outlier so to speak so when i got there it was like who is this guy Mm. You know, it was this guy. You know, I obviously I made my my name known um, sports wise because I played baseball as well. So that was my first love. But 
um, when I got there, it was like, okay, cool. This is a new experience. And it was also a love of like recalibrating too. So I was like, okay, cool. It gives me something else to put my mind on aside from what was going on in my home life. Mm -hmm. And you, and you're very smart academically. So you're able to, to really juggle academics and athletics. I mean, you have no choice. I mean, you, 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 you learn from your predecessors. And it's like, okay, cool. They tell you that you won't be accepted in college unless you have a certain GPA. Okay, well, I, that's all I need to know. So I did extremely well. And one of the, I call it the best stories to, to show that is like whenever, I think the first six weeks that we had, we got report cards and I was living at the time with Laquan Harrell, my mom, who I consider as my mom. Um, and I came back, I came home with like straight A's and she was like, no, she worked great. And mm -hmm. she was like, no. I'm like, what do you mean? I, I have straight A's. <laughs> 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 she was like, she was like, nah, it's too easy. Too easy. It's too easy for you. So she stormed to school. And then this is how we, we ended up meeting Miss Kelly Welch and, and Harry Welch, who I consider to be my parents as well. And sat down and spoke with her and told her, was like, listen, he needs to be in harder courses. <laughs> We're changing all of this. Uh -huh. What did I do wrong? <laughs> uh -huh. And so what are you thinking? Are you thinking, gosh, is she is she being too hard or you're like, Okay, maybe this is necessary. You're 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 a single mother trying to raise a young male. You're doing the best that you know how. Mm -hmm. And so, tell me about when you get on the football field and your expectation for yourself. Be be better than everyone. Be better than everyone. Be better than everyone. So it was like, okay, okay, cool. I didn't come from that feeder system, so I was an, an, an unknown. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I bet now you, you're going to know who the first and last name is. So that was just my job, you know, coming through as a freshman and then, you know, and then, you know, meeting the coaches and the coaches trying to figure out well, who, where has this kid been, you know, and just, you know, just trying to show my athletic prowess as much as I possibly could. Is that, is that a lot of pressure at that moment? Is it pressure on yourself? When all you know is survival. I don't think so. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't think that it really, I don't think there was ever really pressure. It was just do well mm -hmm. and then, then do better than well. <laughs> so going up to your senior year, how do you approach not only academics, because you know you got that, right? You can go to any D1 school that that you want. And so how are you strategic about where you want to go? Well, I knew I wanted to go in the medical field. Um, and my, my parents re really helped me. You know, the, the village really, really helped me. Especially when I got to that senior year, it was like, okay, cool. He, you can go wherever you want. Now it's like, okay, cool. Where do you want to go? And what's going to make the best decision for you? So at the time, my grandparents were still living. Um, so I knew that I wanted to be closer to home, but I also wanted to get away. Um, so I, um, my top five with being strategic was Michigan, Oklahoma, Nebraska, Texas A&M, and LSU. Um, and I ended up committing softly, soft verbal to Michigan because I wanted to see different seasons. It was as simple as that for me. I'd never wow. seen... I'd never, I'd never saw, you know, snow. I'd never, because Louisiana is just two seasons, hot and hotter. So <laughs> I just wanted to see, I just wanted to see different seasons. And then unfortunately, uh -huh. my grandmother ended up getting terminally ill. Mm -hmm. And I had to make the decision to be close to the home. Um, and thank, you know, thank God, you know, not thank God, but it was probably the best decision I've ever made in my life to go to the University of Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. So what did your grandmother teach you about God and faith and your spirituality. That's all you have. God don't make mistakes. Um, uh, he, he he's a light of your life. Um, and when when things are bad, and when things are good, you make sure you pray. Hmm. So you go to Oklahoma, and your grandmother is sick. How does that affect you going forward? I, at that point, whatever happened in her, I made it. For me to be able to call, like, so my grandmother, they had, 
at best, probably a, a, a high school education. Um, so they didn't know much about, you know, the college realm. So, you know, and they're calling because they, you know, they would just try to watch the sports channels and, you know, it's the middle of the summer and they're like, you know, six in the morning. I'm like, what's, what's wrong? I'm, is everything okay? It's, it's six in the summer. And she's like, oh, I saw you guys had a, had a game you guys won. I'm like, grandma, that's softball. Like, you're not. <laughs> but that was just her way of showing, like, hey, listen, I'm trying. You're, I'm proud of you. Mm-hmm. Um, you you know, you're, you're our little Nick and you did everything that you said you were going to do. Mm-hmm. Wow. And so when she comes to the end of her life, how do you process that? How do you deal with that? Um, I was at peace. Uh, you know, it, would, it obviously hurts, you know, matriarch of the, of the family, but I was at peace. I knew that it was no more, you know, no more hurting and, you know, and, and I, you know, I think that we had, you know, upon our last meeting, we had a proper signal. So, uh, it, I think it all worked out for the best of mine. Mm-hmm. What was that last meeting like that, that last time? Um, well, well suffering the, the terminal illness you know, obviously you know, there's no the memory the sad and the other and nobody at the time whenever i whenever i came out i just i think i just finished maybe my first year and i came home for the summer and she was in the hospital at the time and it was like you know you get the phone call from the doctor hey listen you might want to get the family together because she doesn't have much time and you know, at the time she didn't know anyone, mm-hmm. you know wow so i get you know i finally get there and get off the road and walk into the room and you know, I sit down and I hold her hand. I was like, Grandma, you know who this is? Said, of course I know who this is. And everybody's like in the room, like, what? So yeah, this is my Nick. Mm. So at that point, to me, I had already knew whatever happened, every I'm I'm gonna be okay with it. Because so yeah, that was a proper send off for me. And then I got the call of me leaving. I was like maybe an hour away back from Norman, Oklahoma. I got that's when I got the call. So I was like, you know, I'm supposed to peace with it. Wow. Let's take a break here, Nick. But when we come back, I want to talk about being even better than best at Oklahoma and what goes into that process, moving from there to the next level. Nick Harris is our guest this morning. Stay on point. We're back right after this. Welcome back, everybody, to the OPT Network. What an incredibly, wonderfully interesting conversation with Nick Harris. And I know a lot of people know your story, Nick, but there are a lot of people who really don't know your story. And, you know, that the, the spirit of God that really ordered your steps. When you look back at being a little boy in Alexandria, Louisiana, in the heart of the ghetto, the hood, and, and you make it out, how do you process that today? The way that I process it back, I got to go back. You know, it's like, okay, I've, 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 I've got to show that you can. You know, so any opportunity that I have to connect myself to where I'm from, like I proudly state where I'm from, you know, and the kids. And I, I reach out to the one, the Jalen Richards and Cody Fords and the people that come out of my, my city and my town and they understand that, okay, cool, I, I serve as that beacon, you know. The, you know so in, in, in any opportunity that I possibly can, I want to show anybody that serves as a light and a beacon, then that's how I process like, okay, cool, you just, you can't be, you know, you, you can't be selfish, but you got to be as much as selfless as you possibly can be to help mm-hmm. others. Mm-hmm. So at Oklahoma, you go back your grandmother has gone home to be with the Lord. Is there a resolve that you make to yourself after her passing that you're going to get it? You're really going to get it. You were going to get it before, but you're really going to get it now. That's when the pressure came in. I think don't let her down. Mm. Don't let her down. Um, though she's watching and I can't verbally speak. She spoke to me, you know, you know, often. Um, and it was, don't let her down, do your job. You know, and that's pretty much what my moniker was to our college. Just do your job. Go to go to go to class, play ball. And, you, and when you when you when you're thrust into the position to be the guy, do your job. Mm-hmm. So you understand that when you're thrust into the position, you've got to seize that moment. For sure. But when you but in order to be able to seize that moment, you got to be ready. Sometimes you're not. I know. <laughs> so in, in, I think that a lot of times i.e. in like parenting. Sometimes you're not ready, but you got to be the best version of yourself 
on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So when do you know in your knower that you could play at the next level when you're in Oklahoma? When it, when it came easy. You know, the first, anybody that's, the first couple of years, you know, especially in the, in, in the program that I was in, you know, it's an extremely huge program. So you, you don't know. You know, you got guys, and you got guys that are coming in every year. You know, they got scholarship guys coming in every year, so you don't know if they're recruiting more guys to play your position. You just got to – and you just be accountable. And then when you start learning the ropes, and then you can look your coaches in the eyes, and they, they don't even, you know, they don't even – they know that you're good. That's kind of when you understand, okay, cool, I'm, you know, I'm preparing myself for the next level. They're preparing me for the next level as mm -hmm. well. Talk about turning into a man, a man with integrity, a man with, uh, that's accountable. You know, where does, where does that come from? Does that come from who? I was 15 when, that happened, when I emancipated both of my parents. When my mom, Laquanda, told me that I'm the man in the house, you know, she brought me in, gave me that stability and what I needed. She worked, you know, congruently with the, with the Welchers. That, that I, that's pretty much what it is. And I, you know, helped to, you know, rent, uh, help raise my, my, my sister. I knew nothing else. So that happened when I was in high school. So by the time that I got to college, it was like, okay, cool. You just take care of your affairs. Mm -hmm. You was a grown ass man then by the time you got to college. <laughs> you were a grown man in high school. You yeah. were a grown ass man when you get to college. Yeah, pretty true, yeah. So I would get that all the time. Like who, people, you, you know how you get that look when, when, when you would talk to people at that age and people would look at you like, who am I speaking with? Mm -hmm. Like what if, you know, they would, that's when that level of intrigue happened. Like, okay, cool. Who, what has happened to you for you to have this outlook on certain things? So. Wow. And so leading up to your final year in Oklahoma and you're looking to go to the league, what does that look and feel like? Who are you who are you looking to um, to make this next transition? God, from when's coming from my health. No, that's oh. from the, I don't. Um, it was a whirlwind. You know, this last year I'm, I graduate early. Um, I make all America. I get all of these awards. I'm getting ready to play the NAF, the biggest game the national championship game. And not only that, my daughter's about to be born a week before I get drafted. My last year was a blur. <laughs> just, don't get hurt. Don't, just, don't get just hurt. don't get hurt. <laughs> don't get hurt. <laughs> yeah. And so it's got to be bittersweet, right? Because all this has happened and your grandmother is not there to see it. What are you? She was there. Oh, she was there. She might have been there, not there physically. Physically. Mm -hmm. oh, for sure she was there. Mm -hmm. She and, still is. Right. And so going to that next level, what do you say to yourself about not only the possibilities, but about moving into a realm that young men, especially and mostly young black men, a lot of times their their challenge is navigating all these possibilities. Whatever happens, that's what I said to myself. So whatever happens, good, bad, or indifferent, you did it. They can't take that away. Whether you make it, whether you whether there's longevity, whether there's tenure, you made it. Mm -hmm. Take solace in that. Now it's time to try to do your absolute best to enjoy. You're getting now you're getting paid to do what you love. Mm -hmm. And so coming from really abject poverty into wealth, how do you begin to process that? Because I think, Nick, this is really critically important because there's so many young black men who get in these positions and just don't understand the magnitude and the responsibility of new wealth. Well, I blame that one. One, I blame institutions. Um, they teach you everything, but that you know, you get there, you don't, you know, you, you leave college, you don't even know how to like balance a checkbook. But then also too, you got to take that onus on yourself too. Um, so I think it's like a double-edged sword, depending on what it is you seek out. Um, there are programs that are out there. But they're, you know, 24 hour programs, good day. You know, ultimately, these are courses in which you need to take for this financial. Um, and we're, we're at a disadvantage. We're not born into a situation to where wealth is something that needs to be mitigated. You know, it's everything about survival. 
Um, I'm, I'm not naive to understand that. Right. So now you go from surviving to thriving. Correct. And then as I write, but, but it, it, for me and for us, it, it runs hand in hand. Still surviving while thriving. It runs hand in hand. Wow. Yeah. And so like you've thought about your education and you've been smart academically, do you realize that I need to put something in position? So I, I still understand the hustle and the grind, but now I've got dollars here that I need to be able to take care of. Yeah. Yeah. You've got to do your best. And then, you know, then you have, you know, obviously you try to, you know, um, delegate those people that are, that are around with financial advisors and, mm -hmm. um, my, my mom was pretty much the, the go-to person, the no, she was my no person. Um, she was your no person. Yeah, for sure. Because you have people that come out of nowhere. Hey, I'm your cousin. I need, what? So I was like, just talk, talk to my mom. My mom like, nah, I click. So uh -huh. it's just, <laughs> yeah, I just, I just wanted to play, I'm, I'm, unless I'm a new dad and I'm just trying to play ball and raise my kid. So. Mm -hmm. And so what's that? that experience like making the transition from college to to the NFL? It was it's not easy. I mean, it's really not easy. You know, you, you leave Oklahoma and then, you know, for me, I went to upstate New York. You know, you th and then, you know, you think that you ask a big like New York. Nah, it's not New York City. <laughs> you are you are in lower Canada. So it was just not lower uh, Canada. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. Um, it was it was an adjustment for me. Um, shout out to Bill's Mafia. They took me in and I loved every moment. You know, shout out to the teammates that, that, that took me in, the Marshawn Lynch's and the Terrell Owens's. That was like I was a young, you know, I was a young one. So they made sure that I kind of learned the ropes. Um, you know, and then, you know, with me, you know, and we had a you know system going. So it worked out. Wow. Let's catch a break here, but when we come back, we'll talk about the new opportunities that have presented themselves in Nick Harris's life. Stay on point. We're back right after this. Welcome back, everybody, to the OPT Network. It's just such a great pleasure. And Nick, we want to thank you for, for taking the time because we believe that every story, every conversation gives life and hope to the next story. And sometimes when people see the Nick Harris's of the world and, and those people who go on to have success and you speak to possibility. And I believe that there is not enough people that come back to their hometowns and say, you know what, if you want it badly enough and you put in the work and of course you have the talent, then then yes, you know, you can be successful. And I think that your story speaks volumes uh, to that aspect to anybody who's watching. And so you play uh, several years in the NFL and then you make a decision at some point that you're going to make the shift. How does that happen? I don't make the decision. There's a guy in a suit and tie to tell you we no longer want you. So um, I've had to figure out, you know, you got to find your pivot. You know, you go through those dark, you know, if, every, if you go through those couple of dark years, like what do you, because all you've done for so long from August to January was play a sport. Mm -hmm. And now all of a sudden, at 24, 25, somebody who's never played the game before tell you, hey, listen, you're not good enough. Mm. That's hard. That's really hard. Um, but luckily enough, um, I've always been, you know, that, that social butterfly. So along the way, you know, I've, I've kissed a couple of babies and shaken a couple of hands. Mm -hmm. um, and so I ended up getting a call, you know, I think one year out of retirement. And, hey, listen, you want to you you be in this football movie? I'm like, what? You know, so... That's pretty much how it happened for me. I, I, I can't tell. I don't have this grand story about. No, I got a call based on the, the relationships in which that I made. It kind of took off from there. So, you know, that's pretty much how it happened for me. And, and so it's the Kurt Warner story. But but you don't you don't have any experience in acting, do you? Well, yeah. So the, I've been. So that's the, that's what a lot of people don't know. Is I just moved differently. So I've been doing this since 2013. You guys are just not finding him. Wow. And so tell us about that. When do you decide that, okay, I'm, I want to do this. And yeah, not notable films that I've shot was best. One was Best Man Holiday with Morris Chestnut, Sonar Lathan, Tay Diggs. Another one was Focus with Will Smith, Margot Robbie. Um, I've shot over 45 to 50, you know, commercials. You just, you know, it's, I, all I do is do my job. 
And I don't, I don't have to brag and boast about it. Um, now, I guess, you know, this is what eight, nine years in the making. So a lot of people think, oh, it just happened. No, nah, no, nah. mm -hmm. <laughs> I've been doing it. You've been putting the work in and those hours to mastery. And, and so when the opportunity comes to be a part of the Kurt Warner story, you know, how do you begin to, to dissect that? What does that look um, like? I get, a, I get a call and you, you obviously, if they didn't call you, they wouldn't have thought, you know, the powers that be wouldn't have thought that you couldn't get the job done. Mm -hmm. So my job, my mentality is, OK, cool. You make sure that everybody that's involved understand that you were chosen for a reason. Hmm. And and so tell me about the story once you read the script. And and of course, if you are a, a sports fan at all, a lot of people are familiar with Kurt Warner's story and and his faith, you know, to to go on and play in the NFL and to be great. What do you, you know, tell me about looking back at his story. What, what's that like for you? Luck and divine goddess. I mean, everybody's got a everybody's got a, a, a trajectory, so to speak. Um, I have mine. He has his. You know, and and the character that I played has his as well. Uh, it's divine goddess. I mean, if, you know, thank God. I mean, when you look at his story and you look deep into his story, who was extremely implemental in Kurt's life was his wife, um, and and she pretty much led that house, household and drove that train. Um, luckily enough, you know, and it was a bit of luck. You know, a bit of luck. You know, nobody would have known. Injuries happen. And that's pretty much how he got his big break. Trent Green, who was a starting quarterback at the time, went down. He steps in and the rest is history. Um, so it's an amazing story. It's a, it's a great feel-good story. Um, and I think that the production that we put together um, will, will show that. Mm -hmm. And so do you think that now acting will be your, your next? Will that be the thing that that you're doing, like seeking out roles for movies? Listen, I, I just do whatever my agency, you know, sends them with um, being a rep, a movement talent agency, my managers, um, they, they put me in the best position um, for auditions or if we know casting directors or producers um, to put me literally in the room. Um, it's my job to land a gig. Mm -hmm. um, and that's pretty much what I, what I try to do my, you know, my best at everything that I do. So if mm -hmm. they know me and they understand, you know, my, my body of work, my, you know, my, everything that I put on film, just like football, that's my resume. Mm -hmm. And so when you're able to come back and talk to young black boys and, and young boys in general who want to follow the path that that you created for yourself, that come from very similar circumstances, what do you say to them? Believe me. Hmm. What, makes you, what makes you think that it's not possible? So a lot of people think that, that they have the woe is me attitude, you know, the crutch. I come from this environment. But, well, you know, cool. You're right. You do. You, 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 you didn't get to choose what environment you were born into, but you get to dictate where you end. You know, so don't use that as a crutch. And I've always left people like there's light at the end of the tunnel. It just depends on how far you can see. You know, I mean, everybody might not have the best vision, but take it one step at a time. Daily deposits. Daily deposits and life's built on losses. Hmm. I've, I've lost in love. I've lost in finance. I've lost by not playing ball anymore. But you, you build off those losses and those losses create character within that character is your integrity. Hmm. Do you think that being resilient was something that you learned so early on? So when you had those deficits, you were able to, you know, to really not stay there? I got a question. At what point, at what point does it become tiresome? Or does it become enough that we're applauded for being strong? You know what I mean? So I guess to, to, to pose that question, it's like, okay, you know, I get it, get, you know, okay, hey, you were so, you were so, you didn't stop it. Okay, but I'm tired. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, life for me wasn't a game winning three point basket, mm -hmm. you know, so it was like the uphill battle, the uphill struggle, opposed to, you know, a, a slight um, portion of my, my counterparts is like, it's, it's hard, you know, because you look at it as like, a, because again, that mental capacity, you, you have to have that re resilient mental capacity to keep, because when you're looking over and you, 
and everybody's got a little bit easier than you. You know, it's like, okay, well, what point is it? Is it okay, cool, we got to fix this. We got to fix it. You know, everybody's being applauded for being strong. Hmm. So do you think it's overrated? Do you think that in, in some ways that in life you just, you know, my mother always says if you can't take it, you can't make it. So in, in other words, you know, we, we really all have to be strong. Our, just our paths are different. Exactly. You just got, and then, yeah. And then it also, it takes a bit of luck. It takes a bit of luck. You know, everybody wants to be this person or that person. All right, well, that's perfectly fine. But there's someone who writes their check. You know, there's someone had to, who had to speak highly of them in their absence in order for them mm -hmm. to get the gigs. So it takes a bit of luck. Mm -hmm. So tell us about the movie. Uh, Nick, when will we be looking for it on uh, the big screen? Uh, it's supposed to, we were told December the 10th um, is the premiere. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, it's a, it's a great family movie, um, great family uh, oriented movie. Um, and I think that the story will show that level of resiliency. You know, this, this guy went from bagging groceries to an indoor barn house team to get in the call because it took a bit of luck, you know, mm -hmm. a coach happened to be in the area mm -hmm. and saw him. So, you know, it just shows you that, you know, always put your, I guess what I took from it is always put your best foot forward. You never know who's watching. Um, and, and always extend grace because you never know who's going to speak highly of you in a mm. room that you're not in. That's powerful. Nick, what an incredible conversation. Thank you for, sharing and we hope that you'll come back um, when the movie is going to debut and uh, and talk about your character and the movie and what's next for you thank you so much for having me indeed nick harris has been our guest this morning everybody stay on point we're back to wrap up right after this <laughs>